Midsummer Night Madness by Sean O'Farlane. About the author, Sean O'Farlane was born in 1900 and educated at the National University of Ireland. For a year he was a commercial traveller for books but gave it up to fight on the side of De Valera in 1921. He was a member of the Irish Republican Army for six years, taught for a further year, and then studied for three years at Harvard University. For four years, he taught at Strawberry Hill Training College for Teachers, after which he turned to writing and went back to his native Ireland, where he now lives in Ireland, in Dublin. He has written some 20 books, including travel and literary criticism, novels, biographies, and several books of short stories. He has also contributed to all the well-known periodicals in Great Britain and the United States. His other publications include an autobiography, Vive Moi, The Heat of the Sun, The Talking Trees, Foreign Affairs and Other Stories, and again. He has also written a history of Ireland, The Irish, which he calls a creative history of the growth of a racial mind. Several of his books have been published in Penguin. Sean O'Farlane is a dealer of Trinity College, Dublin. He is married with two children. His wife has written several books of Irish folk tales, and his daughter Julia is also a writer. For a second, I looked back into the city, down through the smoke at the clustered chimney pots and roofs on whose purples and greens and blues the summer night was falling as gently as dust, falling too on the thousand tiny beacons winking and blinking beneath me to their starry counterparts above. It was just the curfew hour, and the last few laggard couples were it, hurrying past me, their lovemaking ended abruptly for the night, lest the tans in their roaring Lancia patrol cars should find them conspicuous in the empty white streets of the city. Then I turned to the open fields and drew in a long draught of their sweetness, their May month sweetness, as only a man could who had been cooped up for months passed under one of those tiny roofs, seeing the life of men and women only through a peephole in a, bo- in a window blind, seeing these green fields only in the far distance from an attic skylight. Mounting my bicycle, I left the last gas lamp behind and the pavement end and rode on happily into the open country. Yet though the countryside was very sweet to me after all of those months, among the backyards, worried and watchful lest I should run into a chance patrol or raiding party, I kept listening, not to the chorus of the birds, not to the little wind in the bushes, by the way, but nervously, to every distant tiny sound, the chuckle of a wakeful goose or hen in a nearby farmyard, or the fall of water coming suddenly with an earshot, or some animal starting away from the hedge where I surprised its drowsing heavy head. And once I halted dead, my grip tight on the brakes when a donkey brayed suddenly and loudly, as if he were laughing at the intense quietness of the night. Fallen hawthorn blossoms splashed with their lime the dust of the road, and so narrow were their boreens in places that the lilac and the dog rose hung with wisps of hay reached down as if to be plucked, and under the overhanging trees I could smell the pungent smell of the laurel sweating in the damp night air. And all about me, the dead silence of the coming night, unless a little stream trickled over the road and my wheels made a great double splash as they crossed it. Then once again, the heavy silence drowsy with the odours of the night flowers and cut meadows. I was on my way to the townlands of Farain and Kilpria to see why, to all appearances, the local battalion had been completely inactive for the last three or four months. That portion of my task I did not relish, for I had known and been friendly with Stevie Long, the commandant, ever since the chances of revolution threw us together. Still, I I should be free of the open fields for a few days, 
and there was enough romance left in the revolution for me to be excited at the thought that I was to stay at a house I had known and wondered at since childhood. I might even see and meet if he were still alive, its strange mad owner, whom as children we thought more terrifying than any of the ogres in the fairy books. Old Hen of Hen Hall. But I could hardly credit that he was still alive, for even when we were very young, my mother always spoke of him as that old devil or that old cripple of a hen. And an old devil he was, living up there all alone in what she used to call his rookie rookie of a house, never married, but always in a state of marriage with some woman or other. He began, I could well believe, with women of his own class, officers' wives from the barracks at Bit or Court or perhaps with what we used to call horsey women from some neighbouring English hunt. But judging by his later life, he cannot have been over particular at any time in his choice of women, and many a tinted London beauty must have walked his fields, looking in utter boredom at the gulls, flying after the plough or the rain, hanging in the bare trees, until finally like all her predecessors and successors of many years, she in turn cursed Hen and his hall and Ireland and all belonging to it, and went back gladly to the flickering city lights and the back streets and the familiar loved smells of gaslit theatres and stuffy handsome cabs. Clearly a man who lived by the things of the body, woman, wine, hunting, fishing, shooting. My mother often told us how, as she and a crowd of school friends were returning from their first communion, one cold autumn afternoon, they entered his field to take a short way by the river to their homes, removing their new shoes and stockings as they always did when they left the high road, and they came on hen, and he was a grown man then, standing in his pelt by the river, ready for a swim. She used to shudder as she told how he chased them, and they ran from him, screaming with fear, throwing away the new shoes and stockings as they ran, their legs all torn on the withered rushes of the bog and the furzed hedge tops, not daring to look back to see if the naked madman were catching up with them, until, as she said, they had left his fields forty miles behind and panting and exhausted, they ran into their homes. Hen must have been delighted with his frolic, and I can see him running back for his swim, his long legs and his long neck that gave him the name of Hen's Neck, cutting through the air as he ran. And he must have been especially delighted when in the late evening the fathers and brothers of the children came looking here and there timidly, for the little blue or red socks and the black shoes. It was only one of many such escapades that my mother knew, all spreading the name and the legend of madness that clung to him through his life. We needed few such warnings to avoid him and his estate, but we used to say to each other, somebody's warning half understood, that if Hen got a little girl, he'd salt her. And we went in mortal terror of him, and his salting for years. No wonder we used to say that he had wires hidden under his fields, and if you crossed even one of his ditches, bells would ring up in the hall, and he would come galloping on a white horse with his hungry hounds to salt you. It was a wonderful old house to look at, and often we looked at it from far off, sisting up on its own high hill. It's two gable chimneys, like two cocked ears, and all its empty windows gazing wide-eyed down the river valley, very tall, with a wide door whose steps curled down and around like moustaches. The place was a pale rain-faded pink at the end, but it was often called the Red House, and if it was ever really the Red House, it must have been visible for miles to anyone driving westward to Crookstoun along the valley. Following the little river and its dark line of woods, 
Yet as I tried to recall it now, only one impression remained. For we came into the city when I was quite young, and there I soon forgot the hall. But at least two or three times afterwards my father took me on an unusually long walk in that direction, and each time when he returned he said to my mother, We could just see the red house up the valley beyond Kilna Glory. And each time she said, Glory be to God, I wonder is that old devil hen alive yet, and told us all over again how he chased them in his pelt when they were little children. One of these walks was on a soft wintry day, with packed clouds threatening to drop rain every minute, and a lee and a bride in flood, and the tall bare beeches with their roots. Nests in their tip-tops swayed and swung in the hard wind. The roads were muddy in places, and there were many potholes full of rain or liquid dung, and they were all wrinkled in the breeze, and the flooded river ran frothing and brown and storm-blown by the very edge of the road. Off up the sodden valley, high on its rounded hill, sat Hen's house, and it was really more red than pink that day because of the rain. And as we looked at it, one solitary window showed a light. At the same time, the cold yellow sky behind it was turning to a most marvellous red as of blood, and a scarlet light blackened every leafless twig, and already rain black and rain green tree trunk that stood against it on every ditch and scooped river bank. And lastly, the road and the very sky itself became swarthy, and there was light only in the waves curling the river and the potholes of the road. When the solitary window shone, my father said, That's old hen. And I pictured him as an old man with a beard and long claw hands, half into the glowing ashes, so that I said, I think, father, it's going to be thunder and lightning. And he looked back and said, It might. And to my joy we turned our backs on Hen and his house and faced for the lights and the crowds and the shop windows of the city. Really, I am sure that was not Hen. He would certainly have been down at the bridgehead with his rods and his basket and his gilly. But when those same winter rains streamed down the curtainless windows now, would he not have to stand watching it back bent, if indeed he still lived? shivering in the bay, and returned to crouch sadly, not so far removed from my childish picture of him over his perpetual summer-to-summer -summer fire. You may pity him as I tell you of him, but I, riding along the darkling lanes that night, had nothing in my heart for him but hate. He was one of the class that had battened for too long on our poor people, and I was quite pleased to think that if he lived, he lived only in name, that if he had any charm at all left, he would need it all now to attract even the coarsest woman, for no London light of love would be attracted to his ruin of a house now for other reasons. Perhaps he was beyond all that, and if he was not, he would be like Wan in old age, where the farmer's daughters for miles round would shun him as they would the plague. And for such a man as Hen to descend to the woman of the passing tinkers, for whom alone his house would appear, even yet a big house, was out of the question. And yet not even his maids, who came from a distance, would be in the house a day without hearing all about him from the neighbours. Perhaps, after all, the tinkers would have to suffice. But, thinking of the big red house with its terraced lawns and its cypresses and its yews and its great five-mile estate wall, all built by the first hen, the founder, not only of his line, but of an industry, glass-making, and long since disappeared from Ireland, I could not believe that even such a house would fall so low. End of part one. Midsummer Night Madness by Sean O'Farlane, part two. As I came to the crossways where my road dropped swiftly downhill, the tenting chestnuts filled the lanes of darkness as a pitchy night. 
and under my wheels the lane dust was soft as velvet. Before I took this last turn on my way, I looked back the road I had come and saw up thrown behind the hill that distant glow of the city's lights, a furnace glow that made me realise how near and how far I was to the roofs and chimneys I had left. But as I looked I saw, too, how the clouds were gathering like pale flowers over the inky sky, and even as I, even as I dropped silently downhill, the first drops beat the fronded layers above. On my left, high as two men, rose the estate walls that had once kept the whole countryside at bay, but could not now, gapped and crumbling as they were, keep a fox out or a chicken in. I passed two great entrance gates sunken in the weeds, then the pale ghost-like pillars of the third gate came in view across a gap in the tunnel where the rain was beating down, the dust gradually changing its pattering blows for the hissing sounds of a real downpour. Head bowed, I raced across the unsheltered patch and edged my bicycle through the creaking gate and was just abreast of the little gothic door of the lodge when it swung open and a woman stepped suddenly through the laurels and caught my arm, saying roughly and passionately as she did so, Stevie, why did you go away? Hen was down again tonight. Stevie, I... Astonished, I made no sound. The rain beat down on us, blotting out stars and moon alike. Stevie, she went on, I can't help it. Then she saw her mistake and dropped my hand. I'm sorry, she said. I thought, I laughed to put her at ease. He thought I was Stevie Long. She turned and went back to the door and seeing me from there, look after her, she cried out roughly, go on. And because I was slow and moving for all the falling rain, she cried again. Go on about your business, go on. What a rough, passionate creature, I was saying to myself. Only by degrees, recovering from my surprise as I began to wheel my bicycle up the avenue and I heard her steps behind me and felt her grip on my arm once more. She beckoned and drew me back into the shadow of one of the sheltering trees beside a little house and with the only grace she was capable of, leant insinuatingly close to me, fingering my lapel and said in her hollow mannish voice, you know Stevie Long. Yes, of course I do. Are you the boy he was bringing to the hall to stay? Yes. He told me about you. You know him well, don't you? I know Stevie for a long time. He told me you were in jail with him once. Did he tell you that? I was, yes. Oh, yes. Stevie and I had many about together. She paused, and in a low, trembling voice, she said, Do you know his girl? His girl? Yes. He told me all about her. He said, You know her too. Tell me, where is she? Her voice, restrained against the leash, became passionately intent in spite of her. I did not want to be caught by her country trickery, and I looked into her face by the light of the little window as one always looks into the face of a person he doubts, from eye to eye searching for the truth. Seeing me hesitate, she caught my arm the more fiercely. Tell me! Why, I suppose you are Stevie's girl, I bantered. Tell me, boy! She sent him letters to jail, didn't she? Oh, for Christ's sake, go on and tell me. She had me by the two arms now, her full bosom almost touching mine, so close to me that I could see the pouches under her eyes. Her mouth dragged down and sensual, the little angry furrow between her eyebrows. The wind shook the heavy leaves of the chestnuts, and as they scattered benediction on us, the light from the little gothic window shone on their wet leaves and on her bosom and chest and knees. For a second I thought her blue apron drooped over her two rich, two wide hips. But when I would not speak, she shook me like a dog and growled at me so fiercely that I could not refuse to reply. I don't know, I said. She just sent letters to us. To Stevie, of course, and cigarettes and fruit and things. That's all, I don't know. She threw me away so that I all but stumbled over my bike. I knew it was true, she moaned. I knew it was true when they said it. But anyone might write him a letter. He denied it. He denied he ever got a letter from her in open country. 
It is surprising how the voice sometimes echoes. Under those trees her voice resounded, so that I feared she would be heard up at the hall or down in the village. The liar! He's going to marry that one. That's the one he wants. The shut. And look what he's going to do now. Her great bosom rose and fell in rage. Do, I asked, what is he going to do? Who'd mind ten? I ought to know. But Stevie, but Stevie with his grand talk, he said he'd never harm me, but I won't marry him. I won't marry him, I won't, I won't. And she turned and ran into the lodge, leaving me with the feeling that this hall and estate and country had an unpleasant real life of its own, a life that would spoil for me the few days of quietness I had been dreaming of this last hour as I cycled between the hedgerows. I scarcely noticed that the sudden summer shower had ceased as I made slowly up the moss drive dark with unpruned trees and black laurel, everything here too seeming to send up its sweetness into the soft wet air, even the weeds bursting through the gravel, and when I came to the front of the house the great dark cypresses might in the wet failing light have been plumes of billowy smoke that rose against the sky. I was now on the terrace before the hall, and as I looked down into the valley, there were the sounds of the water of the bride rose murmuring through the air purified by the shower. I almost expected to see the old libertine come floating up like a spectre or a long-legged ogre through the hills. I found my way, as I had been instructed to, to the rear of the house and in by the servants' quarters to the great kitchen. The pale still light of a candle on the table filled the room and at the foot of the table beneath it was a basin of dusty milk, and before the embers an old sheepdog yawned and stretched his legs. I sat down by the fire, and glad of the rest, began to try to understand what it was that so troubled the girl at the lodge, with her passionate raging outburst against Stevie, her cry, I won't marry him, I won't marry him. But almost on my heels I heard the sound of feet mashing the gravel outside, and she came to, to the kitchen. Put on some turf, boy, she said at once, and blow up the fire. As I laid on the brown peat and sat by the side of the machine, turning its handle, she began to lay the table for my supper. Then we heard somebody else approach outside, and with a sudden shake of her fist to me, by way of warning, she opened the door to Stevie. To her, he gave a mere, hello, gypsy. To me, he gave a cordial, here we are again, and he shook my hand several times and told me how glad he was to see me safe and sound. Suddenly, the girl broke in on with us with, put the kettle on, Stevie, for the boy's supper, and sent me out to the rain barrel for some water. I rose and went, and as I passed the window, there she was struggling out of his arms like a wild animal, but when I returned she was again by the table, and he was bending down over the fire, swinging the great iron kettle forward on its crane to be filled. I lay back in the old basket chair and watched him move silently about the kitchen, finding everything where he expected to find it. His fair flock of curls all about his neck and brow, like a mountainy sheep, his knees flinging apart at every step as they always did, and his hangdog head and his rounded shoulders more slouched than ever. Since they would not speak to one another, I began to ask random questions. The name of this or that townland, whether this or that family were still alive, and they answered civilly enough but would never talk a word to one another. A nice companionable house I have come to. I was grumbling to myself and a nice pair of quarrelsome suspicious lovers, and I was wondering if I should ever really have come to this house at all, or if I was to have any pleasure in my few days of freedom, when suddenly Gypsy broke silence to say that a lorry load of tans had gone past two hours ago on the valley road. Roaring, she said, with the great venom and the drink, shooting over the thatch of the houses in the village they had. She even heard, killed a child, and gone on without a thought 
laughing at the terror of the villagers. At that, Stevie burst into a terrible, profane rage, but he caught my eye and fell silent. He knew my thought. If he had not been so inactive for the past four months, the Tans would not be roaring their way so daringly through his territory now. Did anyone come to warn me? he asked. Aye, the girl of the Mullins is, and she added, the boys are wild tonight. I wish Stevie would turn to see me sneering at him. I had something to go on already, I thought, and I was looking forward to my talk with him when the girl would leave us to ourselves. But his mind began to wander from the tans, and he began to hum moodily to himself like a man with something gnawing at his brain until, at last, unable to keep silent any longer, he came out with a very casual... Was, uh... Was Hen down tonight, Jip? I could see her turn towards me as she t answered with a brazen, No. Then she said under her breath to him, He knows what he'd get if he came. At once everything changed. Stevie burst suddenly into a wild roar of song, his old favourite, Night of Stars and Night of Love. The barrer, the barker roll from Hoffman, and he echoed it through the empty house, so that even Gypsy gave me a wry smile as she bade me sit up to supper. By God, John, he cried at me, we'll give those bastards of tan something to think about, won't we, girl? And he caught her up, whirling her into a corner of the room, so that she screamed with sudden delight and in mock fear of his rough hands. Stevie drew a long comical face at his stupidity, and she smoothed herself down and said she was all right, and so they sat in a corner of the huge fireplace while I, with my back to them, ate my salted rashers and my country bread and butter. Ate up there, John, he said, and then I heard them kissing secretly. I am tired, I said. That's the man, said Stevie. And they kissed again, and she giggled to herself, and turning I found her tussling his already wild mop, because he was making too free of her where she sat on his knee. She has great titties, John, said Stevie coarsely, and she slapped his face for that, and as I went on with my supper, I heard him kiss her in return. So they made their love in the dark corner shapelessly, until I was almost finished and ready for Stevie. And then they rose suddenly and left me to walk, as they said, down to the village, now that it was so fine in the heel of the day. Stevie waved me aside when I wanted to detain him, saying the night was long and tomorrow was good too. So I was alone in the hall, listening to the corn crake at, the, at his last dim rattle in the meadows and the doves fluting long and slow in the deep woods through the fallen dark. As I lit my pipe and smoked under the shadow of the fireplace, I began to feel that I should not have come to this house at all. True, it was safe, because it was the home of one of the garrison people, one of those thousand unofficial blockhouses of the English on Irish soil, the last place to be suspected of harbouring a rebel. But with Stevie's girl, or rather, knowing him as I did, one of his girls in the same house, this was not a suitable place for the investigator of Stevie's shortcomings. But, as when I came along the road, the quietness and the peace gradually drove all over other thoughts out of my head. The city, I thought, would by now be as empty as if it had been deserted, the lanceas booming along the naked streets, their searchlights shooting down the dark lanes and the side alleys and the funereal tramp, 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 tramp of the patrols taken with them from every door as they passed its heavy sigh of suspended fear. All this Stevie had escaped, not for him as for us. For months on end, the sight of a rustled roof in a city backyard, the stale odour of airless bedrooms. Strange to think 
that one could work better in that sort of room than where the walls were deep in lush grass and the springtime rain green dipping from the trees into the water butts and the cupped, cupped flowers. The great front door banged, its echoes thundering, and the steps clanked in the front hall. Another door opened and was closed again. The night had settled down about the hall, seeped into the woods, calming the doves, and only the old tireless croaker kept up his ceaseless cry. A door opened again, and steps shuffled along the passage and halted. Then an old man's voice coughed and called wheedingly, Gypsy! I was silent again, and the, I was silent and again the old voice wheedled, now almost at the kitchen door. Is he gone, Gypsy? Are you there, my pretty? And as I said nothing, the shuffling came nearer, and the stick tapping and coughing, and mad hen stood peering at me around the candle flame. I knew him at once from his long, collarless neck and his stork's legs and his madman's face, beaked and narrow like a hen. Even here indoors, he wore a little faded bowler hat cocked airily on one side of his head and over his shoulders and draping his body a rug. He had the face of a bird, mottled and bee-dyed, and his hair tawny in streaks with the glister of oil had one lock at the back that stood out like a cock's comb. As he looked at me for a moment, he pulled the loose flesh of his throat, or scraped with one finger the tawny scum about his lips, as if he were trying to remember however he might not have asked me to come there, or had some business with me that he had forgotten. I stood up awkwardly. Gypsy has gone for a walk with Stevie, Mr. Hen, I said. And who might you be? Young man, if I might ask a polite question, his eyebrows working up and down with irritation and the strain of having to speak. I am a friend of Mr. Long's. He sniffed so that the drop fell from his beaked nose. Mr. Long, he muttered in scorn. So you're another one of them, are you? Eh, are you? I don't quite understand, I said, and mentally cursed Stevie for not having arranged things better than this for me. For the old fellow began to pound with his heel on the floor, and his legs and hands twitched for rage, so that I expected him every second to turn me out of his house at the point of his stick. I suppose, I say, he piped sardonically again, I suppose you're never one of our new patrons. I looked at him in surprise. Come along, I should like to talk to you. You are the first of your kind that I have met who seems to have any bit of education. I'd like to talk to you for that reason. We'll have a whiskey and soda. Will you join me? I returned, no doubt, a little flattered, but largely because I did not know what else to do. And our feet went clanking on the hall flags, as if the whole house were a vault, and indeed there were. There was everywhere a musty smell of rooms long abandoned or never tended. His drawing room was just as I expected, a good room but battered and unkempt like a tramp. At the farther end was a great superfluous fire, and standing by it he poured me out a jorum of whisky, in a glass, whose crevices were brown with the encrustations of years, all the time peering at me around the side of a pink gold oil lamp whose crude, unshaded light made everything look even more drab and dirty. The bare, uncarpeted floor, the fine marble fireplaces mottled and cracked, the china cabinets with broken glass and no china in them, and I remembered the look of the yards with their rusted churns and staveless barrels, and everywhere and on everything the fur of mildew and green damp. Here, drink that, he said, pouring himself another glass and throwing it, off at, off at a gulp raw. That's the way to take your liquor, I suppose. You'll empty the siphon in yours, eh? Hum. If you didn't have a revolver stuck in your back pockets, what would you young fellows have over us? Oh, you're stronger. But have you more grit? Let me look at you. I stood up for the drink, and he peered at me. Ah, he wailed. There's only one thing I regret. 
one thing I've lost, and that's clear eyes. The whole year is like foggy autumn to me. I see the trees and the woods as if they were clouded in mist. It's a great blessing. I go out on a fine evening like this evening, and it's like an evening in winter to me when the light fails at four o'clock in the afternoon, and every hill is a valley, and every tree is twice as far away as it really is. His streaming eyes strayed to the caverns of the fire, but his but the flame was shown dully in the milky cataracts of the old fading pink shop pupils. Why are you in the, this business, tell me? He asked of a sudden. I, I believe in it, I said awkwardly. He threw up his hands in disgust. I believed in things once, he said. I had ideas about the people, the people on my land. I thought I'd get them to do things with their land. I was ready to help them with loans and advice. I'd tell them how to drain it, how to grow more variety of vegetables, and how to make money out of their gardens, selling the produce in the city, and how to make better butter and keep their eggs clean. He sniffed a long sneer at himself and pulled his throat and looked absently into the fire. Look at them today, as dirty as ever, as poor as ever, as backward as ever, and I suppose they blame people like us for it all. If they had my land, they'd know how to farm it, they think. But why haven't they done anything with their own? Why? Why? He was a hot-tempered old fellow, flying into a temper at a second's warning. But you're a city boy. You know nothing of the people. It's people like us who know Ireland. We belong to it. We who've grown up on the land and know it and the people on it. Your people were merchants, I said rather timidly. They made their money on bottles, he said, reaching out for the whisky. And I've spent their money on bottles, he added with the air of a man who has often made the same joke and grown serious over it. For as he began to pour the liquor out tremblingly, he turned savagely on me. And who makes glass in Ireland now, he wheezed. When we stopped, why didn't somebody else take it up? They could make lovely glass in Ireland at one time. It might have become a great distinctive national industry, and everywhere you'd see the men blowing the glass into lovely shapes. People would be coming from abroad to see them. I've seen them as a lad. Poof! And there you had a globe of glass, shining, coloured, glowing. Oh no, oh no. What do we see in the shop windows now? He cried, leaning forward and baring his rotting, easily moved teeth. Cobblers! Yeah, a race of cobblers. That's what we are, a race of cobblers. They hadn't it in them. They hadn't it in them. I saw for the first time how deep the hate on his side could be, as deep as the hate on ours, as deep as terrible as although he angered me, there was so much contempt in his face and voice that I could scarcely muster up the courage to meet his eyes. His whisky was rising in my head. Oh, that was all begun two centuries ago, I cried back at him. It was the Union with England that ruined us and our industries. Can't you see that? It ruined you. It ruined your glass business. Aren't you part of Ireland as much as us? Ah, it's always the same. This ruined us and that ruined us and the other ruined us. I tell you, I'm ashamed to be called an Irishman. And in fact, I'm not an Irishman. I'm a colonist, a planter. Whatever you like. One of those that tried to come and do something with you people. Why didn't the people fight for their rights when they had a parliament? I tried to answer, but he wouldn't let me spilling his liquor all over the hearth, the hearth in his rage. I know what you'll say, but look at the Welsh and look at the Scottish. But they haven't a parliament, and they have prospered. What's to stop us from making our linens and our woven silks, from weaving patterns into them like the Indians and the Slavs? Where are our crafts? What can we show? What have we ever done? except dig patches and plough fields. Why haven't we stuffs? 
yes, yeah, stuffs, stuffs, stuffs of our own, stuffs, how he spat it out. Stuffs that any woman would love to fold around her body, stuffs she'd love to feel against her flesh, coloured, brilliant, delicate stuffs, and he began to rub his little hands down his thighs. Oh, fantastic, I said, and leaned back from him, smiling. Ah, there's your revolver man talking. But it could be done. Or why don't we export bulbs or cut flowers like the Dutch and the French and the Channel Islanders? It's, po it's impossible, the climate. Pah, it's on our side. The Gulf Stream would do. The Gulf Stream, mad hen. Yes, it warms our southern shores. You can grow acacias in Kerry in the open air in midwinter. A rush of delicate hours in here. I've picked London pride on the mountains in early March. Jasmine, lilacs, fuchsias. Fuchsia hasn't a cut flower, I taunted, nor a bulb. He twitched in every limb, dashed his glass in the fire, and banged the hearf with his stick, and stuttered all the rest he had to say to me. It grows, it grows, I tell you, it grows wild in midwinter, in the open air. You're a damned obstinate young fellow, and wallflower, lily of the valley, frisia, gardenia, arbutus, magnonet, and all sorts of delicate ferns. A marvellous but lost opportunity. These things will bring them in more money than potatoes, but they tread on them. It's so silly, really, because it's just like treading on gold. But the people are farmers. What are the Germans, the Dutch, the Belgians? Ah, it was a long drawn out, ah, of sweet memories. I know the people, you city fellows don't know them. Then his voice fell. I know their women, he said. He rubbed his little hands again and tapped me on the knee. I know every sort of woman, English women, French women, Italians. I've even known a Russian woman. The Russians are like the Irish, you know, but too stubborn and too obstinate and too proud, prouder even than the Irish, and not one of them all can equal the Irish women of the right sort, but they're airy. You have to bind them down with a brutal religion or they'd fly over the fields from you. Don't you feel that too, eh? And he cocked his hat, even still further over on one ear, and laughed a little elfish laugh of delight, and his loose lock behind almost curled like a drake's tail. He poked the embers with his stick, he filled my glass in spite of me, delighted like all old bachelors whose club days and dancing days are done to have anyone at all who will talk with them. Ah yes, he sighed as he poured my whiskey, the women are all right. So lovely and plump, muscular from the fields. Arms, right? He moulded them with the bottle in his hand. Breasts like tulips, lovely, lovely. But you don't know. You only know the city. The city. Pah! I wouldn't give that much for a city woman. I threw off his whiskey neat. Why shouldn't I know the country, I cried. But damn, but I do. As well as you, better than you, I know their women. Many a mouse I moused with their women. What's more than that, I was born in the country and born right here in this townland. My mother was born and is buried and my grandmother and all her people before her down, in, down there in Kilcrea churchyard. I lived in the town line, townland of Farain myself as a child and my father lived there before me. I thought he shrank into himself at that pulling down his long neck like a snail or a tortoise at the approach of danger. What's your name? he asked quietly. I told him. I remember your mother well, he said. She held land from me, and I remember your father. He was stationed in Kilcrea. I met him first at an eviction on my land. They shoved a red-hot poker through the door at him, and he caught it, and by God, he pulled it from them, so he did. A fine man. 
I remember that, I said, quiet myself too now. No, boy, no, he said sadly. That was a long time ago. Oh, but I do well, I cried. I remember the bandage on his hand. Not at all, and he smacked the stick on the side of the marble fireplace. This was a long time ago. Forty years or more. Forty years or more. And as he said it, his eyes strayed. Room wet from me to the fire and back again as if he were trying to see my father in me and those dead years that were gone from him forever. Where is he now? he asked. He's dead, I said. Ah, and is he dead? Yes. And your mother? She is dead, I answered quietly. Ah. He looked into the embers, and they seemed to glow but faintly on his all but sightless balls. A quietness more than the night fallen on him secretly and unexpectedly. Just then a step resounded on the hall flags, and the door opened, and in came the dark, muscular gypsy, behind her Stevie, slouching as ever. He did not see me at first, and he approached the old man with a low good night. And I thought the long neck drew into itself again. Hen did not reply, but he raised a feeble hand and took the girl's fingers in his palm. He was as tiny as hers, and the fire shone pink between his bony fingers, ridged with the veins, threaded with the thousand wrinkles of age, as their eyes met the swan's neck curved up to her lovingly. Have you had a nice walk, pretty? Yes, down to the bridge at the pub. Before him, how delicately her lips said, down with a voluptuous upward curve at the corners of her mouth, so that they swept into her cheek as the curved initials on his ring swept into the gold. Her sullen eyes were soft, and in this light she almost looked beautiful. His hand wandered over her arm as, she asked, as he asked the next question, a question as familiar as Sunday. She smiled as she replied, was there anything rising? he asked. Down be the bridge, there leppin, she said. It's the breeze. There's always a breeze flitting down that side of the valley. Stevie laughed loudly at them both, and his voice was rough and coarse beside the rich voice of the girl and the cultured voice of the old man. Leppin, rise, rise, how are you? That was me spitting when she wasn't looking. Oh, then. There was a rise, she cried. I saw their silver bellies shining as they leaped. Ooh, mocked Stevie. Bellies, naughty word, ooh. Han gripped his stick until it trembled and his knuckles strained the skin white. He stamped at Stevie. If the girl says there was a rise, there was. Aren't you enough of a gentleman not to contradict her? But his voice trembled as if he were half afraid of his own daring. Well, he might. In a second, Stevie was in one of his violent passions, almost raising his fist over the old bowler-hatted head. I don't want any English pimp to tell me what to do or not to do with the girl, or any girl, mind that. Hen's hand shook, and all his legs as he pulled himself up on his stick, taller when he stood than any of us. His bent back straightened, made him gigantic by the great shadow that climbed the wall behind him. I could see what a man he was in his heyday, what a figure on a horse, wielding the rod from the top of a rock, a wiry, bony giant. There was almost majesty in him as he pointed his trembling stick to the door and faced down to Stevie with, Leave my house, sir. I'll not be bullied any longer by you. Not an hour. And I'll leave it, cried Stevie, when and only when I choose. I'll not be ordered by you. Who the hell do you think you are ordering? Do you think you can order me? Ho! Oh, but let me tell you, Mr. Alexander Hen, I am staying here. I could see he had taken drink while down at the pub, and the devil was in his eyes. He skipped across the hearth by the side of Hen, and flopped mockingly into the chair the old man had just left. Then he stretched out his hand for Hen's glass on the mantelpiece, 
and wiping the side of it on his coat sleeve, raised it in mockery of the old man. There was silence for a second, and then Gypsy laughed, and the laugh cut through him. He raised his stick and lashed at the hand that held the empty glass in the air, and as the splinters fell I leapt. Hen thrusting his face across my arm into Stevie's face. Gypsy barely holding back Stevie's fist before it crashed into the old roomy half-blind eyes. Hen was all but weeping for vanity. For that laughter of the girl at his age and infirmity. All he could say between his sobs was, You young ruffian! You ruffian! I thrust Stevie back. Hen turned to me. This young woman, if anything should happen to her, which God forbid. Oh, you hypocrite, cried Stevie, turning to the empty air for somebody to appeal to. Oh, listen to that, God, God forbid. Oh, the hypocrisy of it. Yes, 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 I appealed and implored Gypsy to take him away and pushed him from us. And the girl dragged him and pushed him and persuaded him out of the room. She was strangely cool, as if abuse and quarrelling and coarse talk were nothing to her. I put the old man in his chair and filled a glass for him and left him and found Stevie sudden, sullenly akimbo on the top of the steps. He was ashamed. I felt to have played his heroics opposite me and I thought he might not have quarrelled with old Hen if he knew I was there. So I stood beside him without speaking until he said he was sorry he had broken out like that since it would ruin my chances of staying at the hall. I could not tell of what else he was thinking, but I was thinking to myself, where shall I go now? For I could neither remain in the hall nor go with Stevie. My hopes of a quiet, serene night were already vanished. And I felt to Stevie as one feels towards some hooligan who breaks in on lovely music with his loud shouting and laughter. We stood in silence and looked down into the night. A frightened bird fluttered in the woods. A star fell in a graceful, fatal swoop, vanishing in mid-air as if a mighty hand had scratched the sky with light. Biting his nails, Stevie said, Tell Gypsy I want her. I went back to the drawing room where the girl and the old man stood by the window. Stevie wishes to speak to you, I said, and when she went tramping wearily heavily from the room, I looked at Hen, and he looked back at me, and neither of us spoke. As I looked away again through the shining window, I could see the old man's eyes fixed on me. At last I buttoned my coat about me and turned to him. I suppose I'd better be going, I said. Going? Where are you going? I don't really know, but, hum, you were to stay here, I take it, eh? After a long hesitation, I answered, yes, I was, I was. I may even stay in your hay barn yet, for all you know. Good night, I concluded. I'm glad to have met you. No, boy, I won't say good night, and you won't stay in my hay barn, because I have none. Stay where you intended to stay. Even though you didn't choose to ask me, stay. If not for your own sake, for your father's and mother's sake. He rose and went slowly and feebly to the door, his half-emptied bottle in his hand. Could I stop you, he said, if you wanted to stay here a month? Stay and be damned to you. I won't, I said. He turned to me at the door. Please do stay, he pleaded, nodding his head many times to encourage me. Stay, stay, stay. He was maudlin with the excitement and the liquor. Will you stay? he asked again. I looked out into the darkness. Stay? I thought to myself. I must be near to eleven or midnight. Thanks very much, I said, and being satisfied, he waved his bony hand, slipping his bottle into the great pocket of his swallow-tailed coat. Then he turned and went, his little hat perched on one side of his head, and his rug trailing after him on the uncarpeted floor. I sat by the table and looked about me again, at the tablecloth like a gypsy's shawl, at the threadbare carpet on the floor, at the dusty lace curtains,
dragged to the ends of their poles, and everything my eyes fell on him, mocked him and his desires. Lovely woven silks, he had said, and woven linens and stuff such as women might love to feel, and such strange flowers and bulbs as the Dutch and Channel Islanders grew, as Frisia, Gardenia, Mignet. What a liar, I thought, and bitterly I was pleased to end the triad, calling him, as the farming folk had called him for fifty years, a lunatic and he would not deny he was a libertine as well. Gypsy returned, and I told her I was staying in the house, and once more she went and returned. We heard Stevie's steps vanish down the drive, and then silently she took a candle and lit me upstairs to bed. As we went, I asked her what her name was, and she said, My name is Gamma. Indeed, I said thoughtlessly. Why indeed, she said, halting in her step and looking at me. Nothing, I said. It was just a strange name. But I did not tell her I was thinking that the name was well known in North Cork for a tinker tribe in Charleville and Donorail and the borders of Limerick and up into Clare, a name few decent men or women ever bore. Good night, she said, and left me in a great empty musty room. The bed all tousled and the bed clothes soiled and yellow. I lay down as I stood and to the sound of the branches of the trees tapping on the bare window, I dozed and slept. Part three. I awoke wide eyed of a sudden insomnia to the rustled wailing drone of an old phonograph in the room below me. By the light of the moon, I looked at my watch it was past twelve o'clock, an hour when cities began to live and the fields are fast asleep. How many times had I not lain awake for hours listening to the quietness of the city, or to late parties sing their way homeward, before the war and curfew sent us all to our beds. I would be awake now almost until the dawn broke. Rising peevishly, I went to the door, opening it in time to hear a new record begin its nasal introductory speech. This is an Edison Bell record. Number one, seven nine nine. Songs from Opera of Don Giovanni by Mozart. And then through the hollow sounding house, the stifled music of one of the loveliest of operas and humming with the singer, or rather behind the singer, came old blear-eyed maudlin hens crackled cracked and drunken voice batty batty i bade sleep good night and dragging on my pants sat on the edge of the bed my coat about my shoulders smoking a cigarette or watched the branches beating on the panes of the laurels shivering and shining in the tangled garden beneath my window or the bride late rain-laden far below glinted between its ancient gall-black alders under the starry sky questo il fin di ci fa mal e di perfidi la mortale vita sempre ugual the pair in their song died slowly and when silence fell hen kicked his enamel chamber pot until it rang croaking and humming the love song he shuffled out on his landing from my door I watched him almost stumble headlong down the stairs, out of the house, onto the gravel drive, and out of sight into the dark. One by one I began to hear them. Those innumerable, inexplicable sounds that are to be heard at night in a house when all the casual day sounds are still. Timbers that stretch and contract, little insects that make a great creaking noise, and feeling that I had rather be in the open air than alone in this empty house. I pulled on my boots and went down to the open door and out on the avenue and down towards the cottage in the track of hen. Here a chill wind was blowing last year's leaves high in the air, but near the lodge where the drive fell sharply down to the gates. Between the trees on their high ditches the dust lay in soft whispering drifts, soft and white as snow under the moon, so soft that as I stood by the little deserted lodge peering curiously in through one of the windows i might have been a rabbit or a fox for all the warning i gave anyone who might have been inside 
Only a shaft of wavering light lay thrown across the tiny hallway from another room. Moving cautiously to the other window, I peered in again. There they were, Gypsy and Ten. She with her skirt drawn above her knees, an old coat over the warm skin of her bare shoulders, toasting her shins to a little flickering fire. Hen, as he did the first time I saw them together, holding her fingers in his palm and leaning forward over her round knee to see into her eyes. Strange to watch the unequal looking, the unequal pair looking at one another so long, so silently, seeming not to say one word to each other. Her dark head bowed sidelong to his lips, her fallen lashes on her cheeks, her parted lips that never moved he with a smile foolish yet tender, sagging his quavering mouth apart, his old hat cocked forward on eyes that streamed their water to his cheeks. And yet, though Hen was old and decaying, and she warm flashed white to her teeth, full of the pride of youth, and Hen was right, her breasts like tulips fully blown, if anything too magnificently full, too Jewess soft. Yet he could, for all that, raise his hand now with so much languid grace to feel their roundness, hold the precious globe for one moment, so lightly, so fond down his fingers before his withered hand fell, as if in despair, into her lap. That finer woman than Gypsy might well have smiled, even as he smiled now as she smiled now, with head turning slow from that flattering gesture of the epicure, with long slow drawn sighs at the uselessness of such praise from him. To which of these men, I wondered, had this girl given herself? For now, with her hair dragged on the ridge of her chair, and her head falling lower and lower on her bosom until her eyes caught in the embers of the fire, she permitted him to move aside her skirt ever so little, from her bare knee and caress it with his withered hand as softly as if it were swan's down, caress it even after the glow of the fire shone on her eyes drowned in tears, caress it while she sat rigid with misery, her moans breaking out in trembling waves to the whispering night outside, and yet not a stir or word from Hen, but as if hoping that his old hand could quiet her childlike sobs. He caressed and caressed and looked and looked dog-like into her face. Alas, each exhausted sigh was but the prelude to a new shuddering burst of tears like waves that are silent for a while and then burst suddenly and inevitably on the shore. I could not bear those dog-like eyes of the old libertine nor those sighs and sobs of the young girl, and stumbling away from the light of the little window and out of the creaking gate, I found myself walking on and on under the tenting chestnuts in the windy dust-blown lane, up and along the highway. I had come that evening to move to return and sit alone in my unkempt bedroom in the hall, for somehow country and freedom seemed like a small thing under this austere darkness with that pair heavy with one's, one another's sorrow. Down in the weather streaked decaying cottage and with the memory of those drooping mother's breasts and that large mother's belly on the young girl and the look of pity on the old libertine's face, I find myself walking aimlessly on and on. But suddenly across the black valley there rises a leaping yellow flame and... Through the night air, on the night wind, comes the crackle of the burning timber, joists moist with the damp of years, burning the vermin in their cracks and the resinous veins. The flames through the trees flickered like a huge bonfire, and running down the lanes towards Hen Hall, I could see from time to time as I ran the outline of windows of a gable end of a chimney silhouetted against the glowing air about it. At the lodge, the little light was still shining in the window, but without looking through, I knocked and knocked until bare padding feet came along the floor and the girl's voice said, Who is it? Who's there? A fire, I cried. What can we do? Across the valley, a big house. And in my excitement, I cried out, Where's Mad Hen? She answered through the door. He's not here. Isn't he at the hall? 
I was, I admit, a fool that night. I don't know, I shouted back to her. You don't know? She opened an inch or two of the door and looked out at me with frightened eyes. Whose house is it? she asked. I don't know. It's straight over the river, straight across there. Holding her clothes about her body, she stepped to the corner of the lodge and looked across the blazing house. It's Blake's, she said. We can't do anything. They may come over here. Where's Hen? she asked then, suddenly terrified. I thought he was here. She stared at me, astonished, yet full of cunning that was mingled with fright for Hen. Isn't he at the hall? she insisted nervously. Maybe, I stuttered. Yes, perhaps he is. I suppose he is at the hall. Did you try? I was walking. I was out walking, I said. Walking? There was a pause. What time is it? she asked. It's appeared at my watch, saying, it's well after one o'clock. I could see her eyes looking at me with fear and suspicion, and having spied on her, I was ashamed to look up. But slowly I understood why she was watching me in that way. She thought that my coming there that night, a man on the run, had something to do with this burning house, that I had caused it as a reprisal, an act of revenge, and that in some way, Hen too would suffer by it, and that Stevie probably had been the man who carried it out. How stupid I had been, but such reprisals were as yet rare in the country, and it had never occurred to me that this was one until in her eyes I saw fear and distrust and hate. A nice time for walking, she said shortly, and raced down the slope of the ditch and up to the hall, and there she knocked on the heavy hen's head knocker until the countryside resounded, and even a dog, somewhere across the fields, began to bark, bark at our knock, knock, knock on the echoing door. I tried to explain myself. It is why I came to the country, to sleep, I get insomnia, so I got up and came out. How did you get out? Hen keeps the key in his room. The door was open. But I was now concealing something from her and she would not believe me. My God, she moaned. What's happened in? Then in her fear and rage and suspicion, she turned on me. A tigress robbed of her mate. And even in that instant, I remember saying to myself, Oh ho, so it's Hen, is it? Where is he? She cried. What did you do with him? Christ blast you all, you set of... Bastards! What did you do to him? Her voice was echoed by the stony face of the house, thrown back into the fields and echoed there again and again by the barking dog. I know nothing about him, I said angrily. He's probably dead drunk. Knock him up! And I clouted the hen's head until my hand ached. Not a sound replied, but the dog over the fields, now thoroughly aroused, and the crackling of the flames across the valley and within the old cheap dog who stirred and howled mournfully. The girl caught my arm in fear. Oh, it's the dog crying before somebody dies. Shh! Is that a window? Is it the IRA that burnt it? She asked, looking up and then over her shoulder. I know nothing about it. How can we get in? It's for the child to tans killed. Oh, you've something to hen. You've done something to Hen. You've surely done something to him. We found a little scullery window open and through it I clambered and let her in at the front door. Up we climbed the dark stairs, the dog flopping along behind and up to his room and into it. We found him there in his bed, snoring on his stomach with the weight of his drink. His nightshirt crumpled above his bare knees, on his head a fluff laden night cap of scarlet wool. Ashamed of the sight of him, with his dirty toes and the engrimed creases across the base of his neck and halfway up his skull, Gypsy shook him madly into a grasping wakefulness, and seeing me in the faint glow that filled the room smile at his comically stupid look, she straightened his cap on his head as if he were a child and covered his shoulders. As he sat up in bed, looking about him at the angry waving light, like a picture of Wan in hell. Are you all right? she asked. I, yes, oh, I'm all right, but look, she pointed, and he looked. My God, he cried, Totty Blakes. His eyes bulged as he looked, and trying to master himself, he shambled across the floor to stoop in the open window in his shirt, 
Oh, my God, my God, was all he could say. And then, do you hear them? Do you hear the noise? The flames, I said. No, the rooks. They'll never nest there again. They're ruined with the heat. And he began to tussle his cap and sank on his knees, crying like a child. Gypsy stood over him. Gypsy stood over him where he knelt. The Blakes will be likely coming here for the night. He stood up at once like a hardened toper and turned to us. Go down, he said, and lay the table for them, and set the fire going, and you boy go like a good fellow and give her a hand. Gypsy went, but I thought he was unable to look after himself and tried to coax him from the window. I'll stay here, I whispered. It's cold, you know. You must rest now. I'll help you. Come on. But when I tried to lead him back to the bed, he flung my arm aside peevishly. Am I a child? he cried. So I left him in a palsy of trembling, dragging his nightshirt over his head, rump naked, fumbling for his clothes by the pale light of the candle and the fluttering light of the burning house. In silence we set about blowing the seed of fire on the hearth into flame, and I dipped the kettle in the dark water of the butt and the crane swung it slowly over the fire, the false dawn of the fire, and the distant rooks cawing with flight had awakened the doves and all the birds on this side of the valley, and the night was sweet with their music. From time to time as we passed from kitchen to parlour with ware or food, we halted to look at the fire that sometimes seemed to have died away and sometimes flared up more madly than ever before. The air hen joined me and we waited there wondering if the lakes would come or if we should go back to bed and try to sleep out the end of the night. At last he drew me into the room and filled out a drink for himself while I yawned dry-eyed for lack of sleep. I don't know where else the lakes can go, he said. Though if there was another house within three miles of them, they'd rather die than come under my roof. I'm sorry for his two tits of sisters, though. Only two women, I asked wearily. Philomena and Agatha. Two sour tits. And the captain, their father, that's all that's there. Oh, but Philomena is a sour creature. I chalked that very word on the door of the church about her when I was six. Got whipped for it, too. And she never spoke a word to me after. And I gave Akda a penny at the age of eight, and she'd let me swing her so high that I could see her drawers. They would never let me let her see me after that. I once went, he said, throwing back his liquor. I once went to church to handle service, and I had to run out of it when I saw the two virgins singing in a way. To us a child is born, to us a son is given, but, ah, he snarled, they're sour titties. Vinegar for milk they have. Sour and old and virginal. He was getting angry with them, I could see. They'd just raise their hands in horror at a girl like a girl that would that would I stood in the corner of the window watching the sparks rising and falling endlessly like fireflies, silenced as one is always silenced by a raging fire. To think of calamity on one's doorstep. Gypsy, says Hen suddenly rising and going to another window. Gypsy was sick tonight. Bad, I asked sleepily. Bad? Oh no, not yet. Not yet? That's what I said. Didn't you hear me? Yes. He came shuffling over to me on his stick. The girl is ruined, he said, peering into my eyes that filled with shame as he looked at them. What do you mean by that? Gypsy is going to be a mother next month or after. I answered his stare. Who do you think is to blame? he asked. For answer, I looked angrily over the valley at the house. What did it matter to him what I thought? What would all the country think when they heard it? Another servant of hens. It was an old story, about to bear a child. I'll not be blamed, he cried, and his tubes were hoarse with passion. I am not to be blamed. What does the girl say? How does she know? And he went back to his glass and his fire, and then up the avenue in a shadowy mass singing and shouting came the incendiaries stevie at their head ready for anything drunk with whiskey and triumph had it been six months later he could safely have burnt half the houses in the district and we should not have dared nor cared 
nor had the time nor even wished in the heat of fashion. For things grew very hot by then to question any such act of his. But tonight I ran to the door determined to thwart him. He faced up the steps and shouted for hen, hen the whore, hen the cock, the hen's neck, and all about him he shouted with him. Out of the dark in their rough country accents. Hen, hen, come out, you whore. Hen, come out, hen. There was a glint of a revolver in one man's hand as I ran down the steps and faced up to Stevie. What rotten sort of soldier are you? I shouted at him. What do you mean, he cried. Is that what you call soldiering? I shouted into his face, pointing across the valley at the burning ruin. For an instant he looked at it, and then to his men and at me. Ah, he shouted, we burnt the bastards out, didn't we, boys? And damn right well they deserved it. They shouted it back to him, their memories full of the days when their people died of starvation by the roadsides, and the big houses looked on in portly indifference. Again and again they echoed it back to him. And we'll burn Hen out, cried Stevie, and made a dive for the steps. I caught him and swung him about while Hen hung over the iron railings and croaked down at us. If I had a gun, oh, if I only had a gun. Shut up, I shouted at him. The crowd was nasty enough without this. Oh, for a gun, he persisted. Just for one minute. Go in, blast you, I shouted at him while Gypsy tried to drag him from the steps. You're fine fellows. Oh, you're great fellows, I taunted them. You haven't, between the lot of you, fired a single shot in this district for four months, unless you shot a sitting hare or a tame fox. It's what you do by the look of you. And now you go and burn a couple of women out in the middle of the night. Oh, you're grand soldiers entirely, you cowardly mob. You keep your tongue quiet from Stevie. He was a head higher than me. I'm here to talk to you, I said. And I'll give you and your men my talk now if you want it. Let me tell you, you have the reputation of being the tamest commandant. He flew into a passion at once and drew his revolver at me. At once the country fellows skipped aside. They didn't at all like the business of drawing a gun on one of their own. And they began to mutter and pluck at Stevie and to signal me to hold my peace. But I knew my man. Now, now, Long, they muttered. Be easy, now, Long. You won't bully me, I said. Why don't you use your gun on the tans? He turned to them. Are you going to be stopped by a city caffler? And to me. We know what hen is. What am I, croaked hen, who was still grasping the railings, with Gypsy trying to persuade him to come in. What did hen ever do to you, I asked. Aye, what did I ever do to you, gasped hen, hoarse with excitement sweeping his little hat off his head and leaning down over the railings like a man giving a speech. What did I do to you? What did I ever do to you or yours? Ah, shouted Stevie up to him. Ah, you whore master. And I thought he'd blow the old man's brains out. What do you know what's mine or yours, you blasted faver of thousands? Utterly beyond himself, he pointed with his gun at Gypsy and shook his fist in the old man's eyes. Look at that girl. What did you do to her? Answer that or you'll not have a house by morning. Then quite without warning, the rest of them turned and raced over the lawn to the surround, into the surrounding night. Only one waited to pluck Stevie by the arm and whisper, It's the Blakes, they're coming. Come away out of this, they'll know us. I don't care about the Blakes, said Stevie, too intent on having his way with Hen that night to care about anything else. Ask him, he said to me. Ask him, what did he do to that girl? Ask him that. Stevie, Stevie, implored the girl as she tried still to induce Hen to move. I drew Stevie to one side as Hen, who had also seen the Blakes come up the drive, swaying with the weight of the bundles they bore, stood down on the steps to meet them his hat in his hands, like an ambassador or a prince receiving his guests, his head like a gander's head, jigging up and down as he bowed them in, 
and as the two old maids came timidly up to him, peering here and there in their fear, and the portly captain, their father, brought up the rear, peeping over their shoulders because he was almost as blind as hen, they all looked more like frightened ganders and geese than human beings able to look to themselves. They clustered together on their way up the steps, hen wheezing about not being quite up to the tip-top of readiness and saying, you have me at a disadvantage, Miss Blake, but come in. A cup of hot tea now, a shot of Martell's, Captain, most regrettable, terrible. This way now, allow me this way, that's right, there we are. And so into the hall with his visitors. When they were gone, the dark figures gathered about us again, like wolves or tormenting flies that had been driven aside for the moment. I'll make that man marry the girl, said Stevie under his breath to me or I'll burn this house to the very ground. We'll burn him out, they growled, their lust for destruction in their blood. He'll marry the girl, or he'll have no house over his head by morning. But the man is eighty, if he's a day, I implored. And the girl is a mere slip of a girl. Is she twenty itself? Well, he ruined her, said Stevie up to my mouth, as if he would force the words into it. I do not believe it, I said. Another shower had begun to fall by now, growing heavier drop by drop, dimming the starlight and shimmering dark about the distant fire. Stevie waved his hand to, the, to his fellows. The city fellows are a lot of help to us, he said, but I'll show you. I'm not going to stand here all night in the rain talking with you. He rushed past me, up the steps and into the house, with his mob after him. I managed to stop him at the door of the drawing room, and we parlayed there for a while, whispering as we peeped through the cracked door. There, where fifty years ago he had leant across the shining walnut to his perfumed lights of love, smiling quizzically down on them from his swan's neck, approving the painted lips, the tilted eyebrows, always gracious to them, however cynical perpetually on the smile, only leaning back from his scandalous whispering when the butler laid a new course or refilled his glass. There now, he offered his smoke-tainted tea with the airs of fifty years ago, for they creaked and stuttered a little, from lack of use to the two silent, miserable old maids. Oh yes, do drink a cup of tea, Miss Blake, and he puffs out his cheeks to encourage her. Just one? Thank you. I don't believe I really want one, Mr. Hen. Oh, just one cup, just one. But they sat very straight-backed and unbending, trying hard not to keep looking over the valley at their ruined home. They looked instead at the soiled tablecloth, the unequal wear, the tarnished silver, or at one another, or at the old captain, their father, who sat sucking his brandy, heavy-jowled and heavy-bodied, by hen's fire. Or they looked at Gypsy who, careless of her ungainly and girlish shape, danced superfluous attendance on them, full of pity with their misfortune, glad to be in the presence of real ladies, even for an hour. So they were sitting when Stevie burst in on them, calling on Hen so loudly that they almost screamed. Hen, he said, we want you. Don't go, Hen, said the captain at once, as if he felt as much for his own sake as for Hen's that it was better that they should all cling together now. What do you want now, stuttered Hen? I want you to come, Gypsy, too, said Stevie. Oh, Stevie, Stevie, said the girl, utterly ashamed before company. Come on, Hen, bullied Stevie, or will I tell my business here? Out with it, says the captain. One minute now, pleaded Hen. I thought it best to get the matter over, and went up to the old man and whispered that it would be best to come. I could not keep those fellows in hand for him any longer. Don't go, hen, said the captain again. No, no, said the old maids, with the same thought as their father in their minds that even hen was better than nothing in their extremity, homeless as they were at this hour of the morning. But he rose and went into the kitchen as Stevie and Gypsy and I after him. There he turned and faced us, looking down over us, oh, even over Stevie himself. 
and Stevie alone returned his glare. For the girl sat with her head in her hands by the fire, and I looked at the rain spitting on the dark window. When Stevie had finished, all Hen could say was, You liar! You liar! And all the girl could do was weep and say, My misfortune! My misfortune! My misfortune! Even when I went to her and put my hand on her shoulder, she only burst away from me and cried to let her alone. Let her alone, her misfortune. For God's sake, to let her alone, her misfortune. And sat at the table, hiding her face in her hands, shaken with tears. You liar, muttered Hen. I'm no liar, cried Stevie, as the girl wept with renewed shame that no man would own. Now that he ever loved her, Hen looked at her and said very gently to me, Supposing I won't marry her? No harm will come to your person, I said, and faced Stevie on that. Your house will go the way of the Blake, said Stevie, and faced me on that. If not tonight, tomorrow night, and if not then, the night after. But if I have to wait a year to do it, up it will go. I shook the wretched girl by the shoulder. Do you want to marry this old man? I cried into her ear. She gave no reply. Speak up, Gypsy, said Stevie. You will marry him, won't you? You said you would. She said not a word now. I'll not marry her, said Hen. Stevie had cunning enough to play his last card. Then tell your Blake friends to get out of this house if they have sense. Or you needn't. I'll do it. Hen stopped him at the door. Stop. Don't. Don't. And thereupon he sank into a chair with a sudden dizziness and I had to hold him up from falling sidelong to the floor. Gypsy, I said, get a sup of whiskey. Alec, she said, going to him, and he took her hand, her little hand in his, when she stood by his side and said his name. Alec, will I get a sup of brandy? There was silence for a few minutes, with only the noise of the rain cat pattering up against the window, and the three of us over him. At last he began to whisper through his fingers, and I leaned down to hear him. Will she marry me? He was whispering while the spittle drooped like a cow's spittle between his fingers to the flagged door. Now, cried Stevie triumphantly, Gypsy, will you have him? In her deep man's voice she replied, and who else would have me now, since others won't? Others have their own life, and their own plans and plots. And seeing that the old man was not in need of help, she went out of the kitchen holding her stomach in her little palms, murmuring as she went. I will if he will. I pushed Stevie before me from the kitchen, and leaving Hen to himself, we drove the rest of the herd before us from the hall. Into the darkness, so rain arrowy and cold, from the great front door I watched them go tramping down the avenue, and as I too turned to go upstairs to my bed I heard Hen back in the drawing room trying once more to play the host. After his fifty years interval, with his smoky tea and his patched wear, I wondered as I tramped upstairs if he was thinking that with this young wife he might begin life again. From my bed I heard the summer downpour drip about the house, and occasionally spit down the chimney on the damp papers stuffed in the grate, tainting all the room with their sooty reek. Not until late noon did I hear another sound, and then it was the birds singing, and the croaking corncrake, and the doves in the high woods, and when I rose the whole house was radiant and sunshine reflected from the fields and the trees. There was nobody about the house but Gypsy. The Blakes had gone since early morning, and Hen did not leave his bed for several days. Stevie I could find nowhere, and the local men said he was gone into Kerry, swearing he would only return to make Hen keep his promise. Two days I waited for him, and searched about for news of him, and then I called a meeting of his battalion and replaced him by a new commandant. One evening I left Hen Hall as I had come, but before I went, I visited Hen in his room to say goodbye, and I found him sitting over his fire drinking punch and reading an angler's annual of thirty years ago. Be careful of yourself, boy, he warned as I turned to leave him. Oh yes, I said, I'll be careful. Do you believe long story, he said. 
then leaning forward to me. I have no cause, I parried, to believe or disbelieve anybody. He leaned back and stared at the fire. Anyway, he said after a while, I'm going to marry her. She's as good as the next and better than some, even though she is only a tinker's daughter. Besides, he added proudly, if it's a boy, it will keep the name alive. As if he were a Habsburg or a Bourbon. One night, two months or so later, we heard in our backyard bedroom that a strange pair left Cork for Dublin that afternoon on the Mail Express. All their dozen or so of trunks and bags labelled forward to an address in Paris. The woman in a massive hat with a scarlet feather had flaunted her way to her carriage, the old man her husband hobbling and shuffling along yards behind her. His travelling coat almost completely hid him, its tail touching the ground, its coat collar up about his ears, and so weak did his eyes appear to be, that even in the dim filtered light of the station he had cocked his hat forward over his eyebrows, and shaded his eyes with his withered hand as he walked. But I find it too painful to think of him, there in Paris, with his scraps of governess French, guiding his tinker wife through the boulevards, the cafes, the theatres, seeing once more the lovely women and the men gay in their hour. Life is too pitiful in these recapturings of the temps perdu, these brief intervals of reality. The end. in a shed hack and tower, Tagrain will like a jeller sala, Ogly at a melip margarda, Quailly at him sneer front not spying, He's could she at the wagger holly, Or oh shed of a hoalla, Or oh shed of a hoalla. Or shed of a hoalla in a shed hock and tower. So when let yet never art go back in, Maramayan born ye are shocked in. Grain you will snub milch a gaishki, see the foggers farmer holly. Or shed of a hoalla. Darla moon I kid bo wanya or o shedava o alla in a shed hock and tower.